there are only few days left of Ramadan. So let us remember to do a lot more good deeds since the reward of the good deeds is multiplied more during this blessed month. So let's use these remaining days to do more good deeds with a sincere intention. Lillahi ta'ala. I also remind you now to have a sincere intention by listening the, to the lesson, seeking reward from Allah. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Today, inshallah, we will talk about also conditions for the validity of the prayer. Yesterday, we talked about some of these conditions, and today, inshallah ta'ala, we will continue. We mentioned yesterday that among the conditions for the validity of the prayer is for one to be clear of unexempted najas filth on one's body, clothing, and the place of prayer. Now, there are additional conditions for the validity of the prayer. In case um, during the lesson, I say something out of slip of the tongue that is incorrect, please do tell me right away, all right? So that I correct it immediately, inshallah. So also among the conditions for the validity of the prayer is to direct oneself towards the Qibla. When we say the Qibla, this means the Kaaba, the Kaaba, which is in Mecca, okay? If a person can see it, if a person is there and can see it, one directs himself towards it. So one directs himself towards the structure of the Kaaba or the space that extends from the Kaaba in length upwards towards the seventh sky or downwards towards the seventh earth. Now, when one directs himself towards the Kaaba, when standing and sitting, one directs the chest, one's chest, towards the Kaaba when standing and sitting. And when making Rukua or Sujood, one directs oneself towards the Kaaba with most of one's body. Okay, with most of one's body during Rukua or Sujood. Now, the scholars have said, and this is long, long ago, that if a person is north of the Kaaba, one directs himself south. If a person is south of it, one directs himself north. If east of it, one directs himself west. And if west of it, one directs himself east. Now, if, for example, one is um, northeast of it, then one directs himself southwest. So one needs to determine the direction of the Kaaba, of the Kaaba from where one is located. Okay, so one sees, for example, in which country am I, in which city, where is my location from where I am towards the Kaaba in order to direct oneself towards it. But it is a condition for the validity of the prayer that one directs himself towards it. So one does not just stand anyway and says, okay, but my intention is to pray, so I will just stand anywhere. No, one needs to know. So if one, for example, marked a place in one's house, okay, for example, in the living room, I know this is the direction towards the Kaaba. And if a person is somewhere else other than one's home, the room where one is used to it and has already determined the direction, then uh, wherever one is, one needs to endeavor and put an effort into finding the direction towards the Kaaba. So let's say, for example, I'm outside of the house, I'm visiting people, I'm at the mall, I'm somewhere else, and it's time for me to pray. And if I wait until I get back home, the prayer time would be out. So I cannot miss the prayer. So then wherever I am, I endeavor to find out the, the, the direction towards the Kaaba, okay? So one knows that the Kaaba is in Mecca, okay, the country which they refer to today as Saudi Arabia. Now, we said that the scholars from long time ago, they said that this is easy to determine the position of the Kaaba. If one is north of it, one directs himself 
So, so I don't know if any of you uh, here attending today are in the US or in Canada, but in case uh, somebody else later on watches the videos, you know, in case you missed the first part of it, inshallah, I download them to the channel so you can always refer back to them and share them with your um, friends and um, people you know so that they benefit as well from the lessons. So for those people who are in uh, America, in North America and in Canada, they are, if you look at the map, they are north of Mecca, okay? And the Kaaba is in Mecca. So they are north of it. So based on what the scholars have said many, many years ago, what is the direction that they would need to face? If they are north of it, they would need to direct some, themselves towards the south, okay? Uh, and this is what many of them were doing until, unfortunately, somebody who is ignorant in the matters of the religion. This person noticed that the plane, when in the plane, he noticed that the plane first goes further north. That is because the plane has a different way that it follows, but then it moves again. So yes, the plane might first go further north, but eventually it changes and turns again to reach Mecca. The plane has a particular direction that it follows and it can turn, all right? And it follows a particular direction that they are trying to see that is a, the shortest distance that leads them to Mecca. Whereas when we pray and we are, for example, in North America or in Canada, I'm not going to face a direction and then change. No, I'm going to see where is my straight direction towards Mecca and that is by facing south because I would be north of it and I would face south east but it's going to be south so subhanallah unfortunately because this person told them there that the plane goes first north and this is the shortest distance so in many mosques there they changed their direction and they are facing north but their ignorance is not an excuse the scholars long time ago taught that if you are north of it you face south okay i'm not going to go further north i would not reach my reach the kaaba that way subhanallah so the scholars in the past did not say you need to find your shortest distance to it no they did not say, look at the way the plane goes. No. They said, if you are north of it, you direct yourself towards the south. SubhanAllah. So for those of you who are in those uh, uh, locations, in North America and Canada, uh, please be cautious and uh, make sure you know the correct, proper direction. And we have said many times before, do not just follow random people even if they are famous. And, and we know nowadays there are many people who are famous, yet they say things that contradict the belief. So it is not fame here that we follow, rather we follow the truth. We follow what complies with the teachings of the Prophet We do not follow who contradicts that, who, regardless of who that person is be it a person who is very rich, be it a person who is very famous, be it a person who has millions of followers on Instagram or Facebook or on YouTube. This is not the factor, the determining factor here. What we follow is the teachings of our beloved Prophet والسلام, and we are not to contradict these. So then among the conditions for the validity of the prayer is to direct oneself towards the Qibla, okay? And the second condition that we will mention today is the setting in of the prayer time. This means one needs to make sure that the prayer time has set in, has started, okay? So let's say I want to pray Al-Asr, but I'm also in a hurry. I want to go somewhere out. 
I don't say, okay, let me pray now quickly before I leave when I'm not sure that the prayer time has set in. No, I need to make sure that the prayer time has set in because if one prays it before the prayer time has set in for no valid excuse, this prayer is invalid. It is then invalid. So this person would need then to pray it after the time sets in. Okay, so one needs to make sure that the prayer time has set in. And if you remember at the beginning of Ramadan, when I told you that it has happened in more than one place where a person called the Adhan the, for the Maghrib, even though others in the same location, they were still seeing the sun, meaning the disk of the sun had not yet declined. That means it was it was uh, not Maghrib time yet, but he called the Adhan for Maghrib. So those people who started immediately eating without making sure, they would need to repeat that day. And those people who immediately started praying and the Maghrib time has actually not set in yet because the disk of the sun was still visible. It means it was not Maghrib time yet. So those who prayed, supposedly they prayed Maghrib, it was not valid. So when Maghrib time sets in, they would need to pray the Maghrib prayer. So one needs to make sure, okay, these are acts of worship. We are performing them because we want to, we want them to be accepted. We want them to be accepted by Allah. So we need to be really keen on following the conditions of their validity. So then the second condition, is the setting in of the prayer time. The third condition is for the person to be Muslim. Prayer is an act of worship and acts of worship are not valid from a non-believer. The good deeds are not valid from the non-believer, okay? Remember, we said we do not tell a kafir to fast in Ramadan because his fasting will not be valid. And we do not tell a kafir to pray because the prayer would not be valid from them. What do we do? We teach them about Islam. We advise them to become Muslim. If they do, great. That is very good for them. If they embrace Islam by saying the two shahada. If they do, they become a Muslim. Then we teach them about performing the prayer. Okay. So then one has to be a Muslim for the prayer to be valid. The fourth condition is a tamiz. Remember, we have spoken about this before. And we said this is when the child reaches the stage uh, he can reason and discern. So this is approximately at age seven, but some children reach it a bit before, some children maybe a bit later, all right? So this is then when the child has the capacity to reason and discern. The child understands when addressed, and can answer. Then from this we know that the child who is not Mumayyiz yet, what did we say? We said we do not tell them to pray. We tell them watch how we pray because many children when they see their parents praying, they are so eager and they want to stand next to their parents and do the actions. But they don't know yet. They're not understanding yet that this is an act of worship. Okay, so we tell them watch not to come and stand next to me and and follow me when they are not mumayyiz yet. No, we tell them watch how we are performing the prayer to learn so that inshallah when you are mumayyiz and you start praying then. Okay, so because a condition for the validity of the prayer is tamiz, that means if the child is not mumayyiz yet. The prayer is not valid from this child. All right. So Tamiz is then another condition for the validity of the prayer. Another condition is to deem the prayer an obligation when it is an obligatory prayer. Remember, we have five obligatory prayers. Subuh, Dhuhr, Al-Asr, Maghrib, and Aisha. These are the five obligatory prayers prayers. So when one is performing any of these five prayers, 
one should know that this is an obligatory prayer and one should not deem it as a recommended nafil sunnah prayer. Okay, one should know that this is an obligatory prayer. There are prayers, there are other prayers that are recommended sunnah. When I say a recommended sunnah prayer, it means if the person does it properly with a sincere intention, inshallah, the person will be rewarded. But if it is a sunnah prayer and the person does not perform it, he is not sinful. He is not sinful for leaving it out. An example of that is the witr prayer. Okay, this is a recommended prayer. We will not talk uh, about it right now, but this is an example of it. Or rawatib as salawat, the the recommended sunnah prayers associated with the five obligatory prayers. For example, the two uh, sunnah rakaah to pray before praying the subuh prayer. It is very good to pray that prayer, the sunnah of as subuh. Very very good to pray it, but it is sunnah. So if a person leaves it out, does not pray it, then he's not sinful. But he, of course, has to pray the subuh prayer, for that is the obligatory prayer. So among the conditions for the validity of the prayer is when a person is praying an obligatory prayer to deem it as an obligatory prayer and not to deem it as a sunnah recommended prayer. Okay? Now, another condition that we are going to mention, and this is the last one, is that the person praying has to cover, meaning to conceal the color of the skin, when we're talking about the woman, to cover her entire body when praying, except for her face and hands, okay? So other than her face and her hands, she has to cover, from all sides, okay? From all sides. We said what conceals, yes, dear, according to Imam Shafi'i, yes, dear, the feet are included, yes. Uh, we said to cover with what conceals the color of the skin, okay? Meaning the person, for example, from a regular conversing distance would not be able to see the color of her skin underneath her clothes, okay? As for whether the clothes are tight or baggy, this is not what we said is the factor here. Now, of course, it is better when praying to wear uh, uh, something that is baggy and not tight on the skin, for sure. But when we are talking here about the condition, it is to cover one's aura with what conceals the color of her skin. So in regards to the free woman, that is that she covers everything except for her face and hands from all sides. And again, you are praying because you want your prayer to be valid. Okay, you know, you're making wudu, you, you determine the direction of the qibla, you are standing in that direction, you want to cover your aura properly as well. So, my dear uh, sisters in Islam, Make sure, please, that you are covering all your, your hair um, when you are performing the prayer, that your neck is covered, okay, that your arm is covered. And when we said from all sides, I want to talk here about a, um, a gown that in some countries, it was more famous before, but now I'm glad it's becoming less. Uh, before, in some countries, they used to have a two-piece gown that they referred to as a prayer gown for females. And that two-piece gown was made out of a skirt and something, a second piece that you would put on top. It doesn't have sleeves that you would put on top. But in reality, it does not cover everything from all sides because some females might be wearing short sleeves underneath it and when she goes down to make rukua and she is wearing short sleeves underneath it and she goes down to make rukua one can see now from the side what her arm and if she's not 
covered here, then one can also see her neck. So that would not be sufficient for the validity of the prayer. That two-piece gown that some used to wear and maybe some still do today, that is not sufficient, okay? Because like I said, her if she's wearing short sleeves, her arms would show and her neck would show. And maybe her hair, I don't know. So nowadays, alhamdulillah, many people are using what they are referring to as a prayer gown, but, but it is one piece, one whole piece that covers from the head and goes all the way down to the ground. So if that conceals the color of her skin and it is one piece from top going down to the floor, that would suffice because that way all the sides are covered. I'll give you another example. What I'm wearing right now is a scarf and another gown. If I wanted to pray now, okay, I would not just pray like this. Why? Because if I were to leave the scarf the way it is right now and I pray, when I want to make rukua, this goes up and then my neck from underneath would show. That means the side is uncovered, okay? You know that those females of you, if you're wearing a scarf, you know, if I put my hand underneath, you know, you, your neck it would show. So if I pray that way, and when I go down for rukua, I bow for rukua, this would not stick anymore here. So my neck would be uncovered from the side. So I would not pray that way. What we could do, we females, when we are, for example, outside and we're wearing our scarf this way, what we could do is before we pray is tuck in our scarf. So I would take the scarf that I'm wearing now and I would tuck it in from all the sides, from the back and from the front, from all the sides. I will answer the question, inshallah, at the end, okay? So I read it carefully. So um, I would tuck that scarf from all the sides underneath. And that way I have everything tucked in and the gown goes all the way down. Okay, the gown needs to go all the way down. That would suffice then. But if I were wearing a skirt that does not cover the feet all the way down, what did we just say? That would not suffice. Then I would need to wear another skirt on top of it and I would let it down more to the floor. I would not lift it up all so that the feet would be covered as well. Okay. So for the free female, when praying, she has to cover all her body except for her face and her hands. They can show. Okay. They can show and um, from all the sides. Okay. And what we meant from all the sides, I just explained it to you. So that when the when the female is making rukua, for example, nothing would show, not from her arms, not from her neck, all right? And down to the floor to cover her feet. Now, um, inshallah ta'ala, there's something that we will talk about when we get to talk about the integrals of the prayer. But I will mention it now, since we're talking about covering, uh, also for the sisters, my dear sisters, Make sure that part of your forehead is uncovered when you pray. So do not take your part of the scarf all the way down where the whole forehead is covered. No, <clears throat> because when making sujood, when making prostration sujood, part of the uncovered forehead, forehead needs, needs to touch the ground. So when making Sujood, prostration, part of the uncovered forehead needs to touch the ground where I'm praying, okay? So make sure then that your scarf does not cover your forehead completely when praying, okay? If other than prayer, you want to cover your face, good, good. But when praying, part of your forehead needs to be uncovered to touch the the ground okay so we spoke regarding the free female what she needs to cover for praying i said that her hands can sh uh, can show but if she wants to cover them fine of course during prayer 
uh, but if they are uncovered during prayer, that is fine. As to the male when praying, what does the male cover when praying? He covers what is between his navel and knees. Again, from the sides. Okay, from the sides, he covers what is between his navel and knees. Okay, any questions about what we mentioned? By that, we have concluded now talking about the uh, conditions of the prayer. These topics that we are covering now are very, very important. So I do kindly ask you to invite your friends and tell them about these lessons. On Saturday and Sunday, we will not have a live lesson, but inshallah, I will record very important lessons for you and share them with you in the group and upload them on the YouTube channel as well. Inshallah ta'ala, on Monday, um, I will notify you. And on Monday will be the uh, observation of the crescent. And based on that, we would know then whether the next day is Eid or not. SubhanAllah, the month passed by very fast. And I enjoyed seeing you every time here. Inshallah ta'ala, after Ramadan, we will continue with these valuable lessons. We will uh, decide on a time together, inshallah, and we will continue with the lessons. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a hadith, which means that the believer does not have enough of hearing good things until death. So the believer is keen on learning the religious knowledge until death. So just because later on Ramadan will be over, it doesn't mean that we do not continue learning. No, inshallah, I continue learning and you continue learning and we teach what we are learning to others until death comes our way. And inshallah, we remember the sincere intention when performing the good deeds, seeking reward from Allah Ta'ala. Let me just see the question that the sister had. Uh, yes, dear. Yes, dear. Because according to Imam al-Shafi'i, the feet of the female are awra. So she covers them when she prays and she covers them when she goes outside as well. Yes. Now, I will tell you this since you asked and there are many females probably whom you are seeing not covering their feet. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, and this is also another, of course, very knowledgeable scholar, um, they are both highly righteous scholars of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So some females might be following his teaching where he said that it is not Aura. In that case, you know, if they are doing that to follow his teaching, then they are allowed to do that, okay? Because he said that the feet of the female is not aura, all right? But he said the feet, okay? Not above that, not the shin, because, and now actually it's a point to mention that, subhanAllah, we are to follow who? The best creation of Allah, Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and not trends on social media that contradict the teachings of Islam. And nowadays we are seeing many females, unfortunately, wearing pants that cover half of the shin, okay? That expose half of the shin. If half of her shin is um, visible, this is sinful. We are seeing um, many who, for example, wear a scarf, and that is good definitely, that she is covered at least from the top, but her um, half of the shin is showing. So that would need to be covered, okay? Because Abu Hanifa said the foot is not aura, the foot, but not half of the shin. So if a person wants to follow Imam Abu Hanifa in that regard, and she does not want to cover her feet, but then she makes sure that she is covering her shin, okay? Because, you know, I'm assuming she wants to follow the rules of Islam and she does not want to disobey Allah. She does not want to fall, to fall into a sin. So she is to wear the long pants, not the one that um, uncover half of her shin. All right. So I guess there are no more questions. May Allah Ta'ala bless you. Um, 
my dear sister, if you are, you are saying you've been praying with your feet showing, I'm assuming probably you've been following Imam Abu Hanifa because you were taught that they can show. But the thing is that I'm also going to advise you now is um, you want to make sure that way not for, to have more than the foot show when prayer, when praying, okay? Not to have more show. For example, when you go down for sujood or rukua, make sure that not more than that is exposed. So even if you probably have been following Imam Abu Hanifa in this regard, dear, make sure that not more than the feet is showing. And I would advise you now, be on the safe side, cover from now on your feet as well when praying. Okay, dear? Barakallahu fikum. Let us say tahleel together. Lillah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. رب اغفر لي وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات رب اغفر لي وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات رب اغفر لي وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات I'm not sure if you're all in the WhatsApp group and you are receiving the links to the videos after I upload them and I told you I go through the videos again before I upload them just to make sure that there was no slip of the tongue because sometimes it happens, subhanAllah. So if any of you are not in the WhatsApp group, you can text me. If you have my number, text me to add you into the group so that you also receive other benefits. The links to these videos after I upload them and other benefits, inshallah ta'ala, on a daily basis. May Allah ta'ala bless you. Assalamu alaikum.